Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. And also, thank you to Francis Coppola, who's come over from Britain to hold this talk. We very much appreciate that. And it's going to be, I think, a very interesting talk. I'll keep this very short. We always do. This is the second talk in the 2019 season of our series, Economics Beyond the Swabian House, for our, which in the meantime, we have ironically term a literacy campaign in economics. And it's been made possible due to you know, a lot of people contributing. The Luxembourg Stiftung, Helle Panke Stiftung, Netzwerk Plurale Ökonomik, those are students, and Oxy, uh, which is a website and a newspaper. I think some are in the back if you'd like to have them. I won't say anything about Brave New Europe. You have sheets of paper in German and English, which explains everything. All right, enjoy your evening. And thank you once again, Francis, for coming. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah? And I'm hoping the video lady at the back can see me as well. Yes? Good. OK, I shall try and keep still, because I know that there's translation going on, and I don't want to know any anything to be lost in translation, as it were. So tonight, I want to maybe challenge a little bit the way in which you think about the economy, and in particular, to challenge the way in which we think about finance. My, my background is in banking and finance and a bit of economics, but I'm also a musician by training, so, you know, I'm into kind of flows, because music's a flow, isn't it? Yeah? And harmony is kind of a stock? Yeah? <coughs> Flows and stocks. Money is a flow. It's also a stock. I think that confuses a lot of people. And what we like to do is simplify things, and I think sometimes we oversimplify things so much that we lose the essence of their nature. And we forget that the economy we're creating really is an emergent phenomenon, an adaptive phenomenon, and a representation of ourselves and what we are as a species. So where I'd like to start is by saying the economy, and particularly finance, is a bit like life. By which I don't mean kind of life, the universe, and everything else. I mean life as it has been on Earth for a long time. I've got a nice picture of a hurricane up there, and I'll come to that in a minute. But a hurricane is a big, big crisis event that when it hits an established population, as Hurricane Katrina did, can wipe out part of that population, can deform the environment in a way that turns it into something different. It will never be the same again. New Orleans will never be the same again. So it is with our financial system. We can have crises in our financial system that wipe out part of what was there before and deform our economy in ways from which it never recovers. It transforms them, the economy, into something else. And it would be quite difficult to see what that something else is. So I kind of want to start, really, by talking about mass extinction. Now, I know lots of people would like there to be mass extinction of banks, but I was thinking more of mass extinction of life, really. I've been reading a book about mass extinctions. It's a fascinating book. It's called The Ends of the World. It's by Peter Brennan. We're used to thinking of mass extinction events as being, oh, yeah, that was when the dinosaurs died, wasn't it? And we know that was caused by an asteroid, right? We even know where the asteroid fell. It fell in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, and it caused um, a winter that wiped out large amounts of life on Earth, including all the big dinosaurs. Yeah, mass extinction. It might surprise you to know, I mean, if there are any um, um, uh, anthropologists and, uh, uh, I mean, you know, evolutionary scientists in the room, you know this already, no doubt. It might surprise you to know that the dinosaurs' mass extinction was occurred quite late in the history of the Earth, and there had been several before it, some of which were very much bigger. 
Now, the dinosaurs wipeout was caused by what we call an exogenous event. You will find in economic circles, they will talk about the economy as if it's a, a just basically trundles along in equilibrium until it gets hit by a shock. So some asteroid from outer space hits it and knocks it off course. And if it's a big enough asteroid, then it can knock it permanently off course. Right? But basically, if it wasn't getting hit by shocks all the time, then it would trundle on pretty much the same as it did before. So our dinosaurs were trundling on quite happily in their swamps until they got hit by an asteroid, which wiped lots of them out. But in the previous mass extinctions, it wasn't asteroids that wiped them out. Two of the previous mass extinctions were caused by something that was endogenous to the Earth. They were wiped out by massive volcanic eruptions. Volcanic eruptions on the scale at which we today, in our relatively calm period of, of geological history, can barely imagine. The Siberian traps and the Deccan traps in India, both of which are um, volcanic in origin, are absolutely mammoth. And those two volcanic eruptions both caused mass extinctions. But that wasn't an asteroid strike, that was something that the Earth does. Because the Earth is a fluid system and in many ways a chaotic system and once in a while it does a violent, a violent episode like that and things die. And for me one of the most fascinating stories in there was one mass extinction that appears to have been caused by life itself. The growth of a new life form that changed the climate, cooled cooled the earth and caused the death of much of the old ecosystem. That life form was trees. I was fascinated by that. So we can say we have shocks that come from outer space like an asteroid that hit our earth and cause chaos and cause many things to die. We can have things that are endogenous to the Earth itself, like massive volcanic eruptions that wipe out large amounts of life. And we can have things that are endogenous to life that can cause the deaths of large, amount of life, of, of large amounts of life. The dominant species is, has a habit of um, changing the climate of the Earth enough to wipe out large amounts of life, including itself. Um, it's slightly worrying that we're in another period of mass extinction at the moment caused by humans, um, which appears now to be reaching the stage of climate change in the climate. It doesn't bode terribly well for our future, but this is another story and it's not my subject for tonight. My point is that in many respects life forms itself and deforms itself and reinvents itself as a result of these crises which may occasionally be due to something that's hit you from outer space, but are much more often due to something that's actually endogenous either to the environment or to life itself. And the financial system works like that. <coughs> so if we look at the kind of shocks that we get in the economy and in finance, we can get things where we have an asteroid hit us from outer space. Well, okay, it might not be an asteroid from outer space, but in terms of our emergent evolutionary um, economic system, something that the Earth does could be regarded as exogenous to it. It's not part of something we did. So I'm going to give you an example, which actually might surprise you because it's often thought of as an endogenous shock, this one. In 1995, a bank failed. Has anybody heard of Bearings Bank? Yeah? Um, it was actually caused by a rogue trader who had, um, who was gambling the bank's money away. When he lost all the money, the bank went down. Okay, that's an endogenous shock, isn't it? Because it's come from within. Uh, no. It was a massive fraud, but he would have got away with it if it hadn't been for something un unexpected that happened. He was betting on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, and if the Tokyo 
stock market had done exactly what he expected, which was to carry on rising as it had been, um, he would have got away with it. He would have recovered his losses and Bearings Bank would not have failed. He certainly didn't expect a major crash. There was no reason to expect it. But, but then there was a big earthquake in a city called Kobe in Japan and the Tokyo stock market crashed and he lost everything and Bearings Bank bled to death. So an exogenous event wiped out a life form. Yeah, but actually in the financial system those kind of things are quite rare. We do get a few of them, we get Fukushima for example, we get a tsunami, we get, you know, things like that, from, and they always have an economic impact. We have a volcanic eruption that grounds our planes for three weeks, it happened in 2010. There was an economic impact from that. But I don't know if you noticed that the economic impact can be quite short-lived and it may not wipe out that many life forms. The exogenous event that wiped out the dinosaurs was not the biggest of the mass extinctions by a long way. It was the endogenous ones that did the damage. So if we talk about endogenous um, shocks in finance, well, it could be a shock that is endogenous to the economic system and not specifically to finance. So it might be a political decision, for example. So we might say that the um, dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1992 wiped out the Soviet Union's financial system completely. Um, left the satellite states, such as Latvia, with no banking system at all. But it was a political decision. It was a major shock. Those, this, after the um, collapse of the Soviet Union, the countries involved suffered major, major economic and financial crises. We had episodes of hyperinflation. But it wasn't fundamentally a financial crisis. It was a political one. But boy, did it wipe out a life form. And it fundamentally changed the nature of the world economy and indeed of the geopolitical economy of the world. So what about financial ones? We get those too. And in fact, as you know, we've had one relatively recently because that's what 2008 was. It was a crisis which was endogenous to the financial system. It, you will hear people saying, oh, but it was Lehman. And that was a political decision or it was a shock that couldn't have been predicted. Yes, it could. You could see it coming a mile off. Now, what characterizes endogenous shocks as opposed to exogenous ones is you can see them coming. It's a little bit difficult to see asteroids coming yeah they kind of hit you without warning i mean certainly if you're kind of the kind of life forms they you know if you're a dinosaur you probably wouldn't know that an asteroid was about to hit you but with endogenous shocks both in the natural world and in the economic and financial system what an endogenous shock is is the release of a long slow build-up of pressure So we get the creation of big, big distortions that eventually have to collapse. And when they collapse, they do so in a disorderly fashion and they wreak havoc. And the bigger the distortion, the worse it is when it collapses. So that's the first of my analogies. Try thinking of the economic and financial system as this rather more evolutionary and adaptive and almost chaotic system that has the persistent disturbances that form into um, uh, things that need to release pressure that collapse in a heap because they just can't be sustained anymore. And we'll come on, on a bit into how those form because I think it's just really important. But it's important to think of it like that. We don't have an economy that is a well-oiled machine that keeps ticking along like this until it gets hit by something. No, we have something that is actually not a very well old machine at all. It's much more chaotic than that. So my second analogy is some, yeah, finance is a bit like the weather, really. It's a chaotic system, and that's the reason why I have a hurricane up here. 
we actually understand, you know, we're beginning to learn to understand weather systems a little bit enough to predict them. But we are a long, long way from controlling them. And they certainly aren't a well-oiled machine that we can pull this lever and pull that lever and get it going in that direction and that direction. No way. The best we can do is try and see what's going to hit us in about three days' time. Maybe. The thing about weather is it's the movement of a fluid, air, right? Air masses move in different directions and they can move very fast and people who've been in aeroplanes just know just how fast the jet stream is and how big it is. It's the movement of air currents around the world and the way in which they shift and the way in which they interact each other creates weather, creates climate creates storms, persistent disturbances in airflows, cause eddies, storms, hurricanes, tornadoes. They are a part of the weather system. They can be minor, they can be mammoth, they can do little damage, or they can do immense damage. And our financial system is like that. These things, these eddies, these disturbances form all the time. Many of them dissipate harmlessly, but once in a while we get Katrina. And it lands in a densely populated area and it causes chaos. And that's what happened in 2008. So, how did it happen? And what I'm going to say may surprise you. This is a European meeting, right? So why am I talking about an American crisis? So the first thing I'm going to say to you is it was not an American crisis. It was a transatlantic crisis. And the problem was that people could not see beyond their own backyard. So this is what the Americans thought was happening. Okay. This is the original, I've kind of roughly drawn out here the American originator distribute model. What the Americans thought they were doing was taking mortgage loans and other types of loans as well, they securitize everything, um, issued to US households and corpora corporations, securitizing them and then releasing them out into the capital markets, selling them on to international investors. Everybody would take a little bit of the risk involved. It would go out, spread out among a myriad of operators, Nobody would take any serious risk, and if anything happened, it would dissipate out harmony and it wouldn't be a disaster. That's what the Americans thought was happening. And once it got to the capital markets, that big bar in the middle, they kind of didn't look beyond that, really. There was like a, a boundary. When they kind of went, OK, we've done our bit. Out there. And don't think about it anymore. Just assume it will dissipate harmlessly. It's a model they still use. They still securitize, even now. Even after everything that's happening, they still routinely securitize loans. They take them off bank balance sheets, convert them into securities, and chuck them out into the world's capital markets. They still do it now. It's hard to say they didn't care what happened. It was more that they didn't understand what happened once these things got out into the capital markets. And in particular, they didn't understand the feedback loops that were forming. They didn't see them. Even though these things came back to them, they didn't see them. What was actually going on, a nice picture here, was um, a nice little transatlantic, in transatlantic industry. You'll notice where this is centered. In the second chart, you will see that the, uh, the nexus, if you like, was the UK, was London. So we had deposits crossing the Atlantic, dollar deposits, and then coming back again. It was all in dollars. But if you look at the first one, you will see that Europe, Europe was involved as well. This, this little, these little maps are from a paper by um, Dong and McCulley, in which they talk about the growth of what's known as the euro dollar market in the run-up to the financial crisis. It got mammoth. 
it got huger and huger and huger, with more and more dollars crossing the Atlantic and more and more securities being produced. And you note that it's a circular loop. <coughs> Things weren't dissipa dissipating out to investors. They were going around in a circle. So rather than what the Americans thought was happening, this is what was actually going on. Uh, this is a circular flow. You can see this, can't you? Right? It goes around in a circle. Actually, you can start this anywhere and finish it anywhere. <laughs> um, the important thing is that everybody's involved. And you notice that I've put at each stage risk transfer, and I'll come on to that in a minute, that at each stage, everybody was trying to get rid of risk. So they all thought it was safe. And because they weren't looking beyond their own backyard, so the Americans had gone like that about into capital markets, US regulated banks chuck it over into the capital markets. That's where the shadow banks and money markets bit fits, by the way, is in capital markets. We don't know anything about anything, with that, anything, uh, anything about that. The euro dollar market was entirely offshore. It was huge. It was nothing to do with us. But equally, in Europe, there was a lot of nothing to, us, to do with us going on as well. So even after the financial crisis hit, we had European politicians saying, well, it's nothing to do with our banks. It was all American. It wasn't. See what's at the top there? European banks. European banks were every bit as involved in this as the US ones. They were actively involved in securitization, in marketing these things to investors. And later on, they even got involved in actually issuing the loans that were being securitized. Many European banks bought the mortgage-backed securities that were being aggressively marketed by investment banks. Some of the banks that bought them were not particularly large. Some of the biggest investors in these things were German landers banks. But the point is, nobody thought they were taking any risk. They were all passing on the risk to somebody else. That's what securitization does, after all. It passes on the risk to somebody else. So if you've bought a security and then you bought some insurance against it, you know, see I've got insurance here? So your US households were providing insurance, insured deposits to US regulated bank, which acts as a form of insurance for them, for their funding. And the shadow bank, tanking, shadow banking sector, things like AIG, were providing um, credit default insurance to um, other shadow banking participants, reducing their, um, their risk as well, supposedly. The only trouble was everybody was insuring everybody else's risks. And they were insuring the same risks multiple times. So the whole thing was leveraging up. Money was growing, risk was growing, securities were growing, it got huge. And all because nobody really knew what was outside their own backyard. Just ha you can see in this chart a little bit just how big the flows got. I've nicked this from the BIS. But can you see the way the flow goes kind of like, it's like a, it kind of goes like that and then contracts again. Yeah, can you see? So in four, five, six, seven, we got this massive, massive increase in capital flows um, to, to and from the US. It expands in both, di both dimensions, both to and from. And then it contracts right down again when the financial crisis hits. You see the drop between 2008 and 2009? <coughs> right. When I talked about a long, slow build-up, this is what I'm talking about. You see the way it built up over quite a few years and then it suddenly crashed? Right? This is characteristic of financial crises. This is why I say they are exogenous events. They are the characteristic of an exogenous event is this long, slow build-up of pressure which suddenly releases. This is what you're seeing here. Now, there have been some ideas about why it was that this thing grew. Hyung Song Shin of the Bank of International Settlements came up with this pretty model, which is quite flawed, really, because it makes it look as if um, the money from US households came from Mars. But what he's trying to point out here 
is the boundary, which is something I said before. Nobody sees beyond their own backyard. So here's the boundary around the US regulatory system and the industry that is actually um, causing the growth of this endogenous, of this um, storm system is outside that boundary. It's the shadow banks, the wholesale funding market and the European banks. One of the things he pointed out was that part of the problem was different regulatory regimes between um, the United States and um, Europe. So in the United States, banks were, had an incentive to try and get things off their balance sheets, yeah? whereas in Europe, European banks were incentivized to make their, bank, their balance sheets bigger and bigger and bigger with low-risk assets. And this is why the low risk, this is why the getting rid of risk thing is so important. The characteristic of the, of the mortgage-backed securities that failed in the crisis was that they were highly rated. They were regarded as risk-free. They weren't taking risk. They were investing in things that weren't risky except they turned out to be, and this is the problem, that risk was being mispriced. So why was it being mispriced? Well, this is kind of why. It's back to our circular flow. So you have the different regulatory regimes, you have the different things, you have the flow of funds. You see, notice this goes in two directions at once. So, the even, so even though they were accepting collateral against the loans, the collateral itself was leveraging up and becoming more risky. It all went round in a big circle with everybody accepting the risk from everybody else. And so instead of these things being low risk, they became high risk. Instead of risk dispersing safely um, across <coughs> many participants, as the Americans thought it did, it was actually concentrating in a much smaller number of market participants which were big and important and if they failed, would have a devastating effect upon the economy. This is a, does it even look like a storm, this? I'm hoping it does. Does it look? Because when I first drew this, I remember looking at it and thinking, that's a storm system. It, because it spins, and it grows, and it leverages up, and eventually it collapses. These things can occur in many areas, and one of the most interesting ones that I came across um, is actually not in banking. When I showed this to my father, this picture, he looked at that and he said, oh, we had one of those. Really? You worked in insurance? What are you talking about? And he said, yeah, we did. Mid-1980s it was. We had a big spiral storm system like that that nearly destroyed the venerable insurance market of Lloyd's of London. I didn't know anything about this. I've never worked in insurance, so I didn't know. I said, well, tell me more. And um, he told me about what is known as the London market excess spiral of the mid-1980s. Now, the only other person I have come across who talks about this incessantly is John Kay of the Financial Times the Economics Professor, who in 2007 wrote an article in the Financial Times talking about the London market excess spiral and the damage that it did and warning that the derivative spiral looked very similar and he thought it would end the same way. And boy, was he right. So let's talk a little bit about that, because as we're going to see, these things occur all over the place. They're not as rare events as we have been led to believe. We've been told that this kind of financial crisis happens once in 70 years. The last one was the Great Depression. They're not. They happen much more often than that, and in different areas, different parts of the world, and in different bits of finance. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about... Excuse me, I'm going to move on beyond that talking about the insurance aspect of this, because one of the untold, part of the untold story of the financial crisis is the role of insurance. This is a depiction of how risk dispersion in insurance markets is supposed to work. 
right? It's roughly linear, um, which is a little unlike this kind of chuck it over the fence thing that the Americans were doing with the capital markets um, with originated distributed. You know, it's, it's a little more kind of everybody laying off risk to somebody else. So we have households insuring their risk, right? by taking out a contract with the insurance company, which they pay for with a premium. And what they're, what, that, what they're doing is paying that insurance company to take their risk of, for example, um, having their house burgled. Um, corporations also take out insurance for the same reason. Their risks tend to be very much bigger. And actually, this is important because the particular risk that was being insured at the time that, of the LMX spiral was actually um, an oil rig. So the insurance company then lays off part of that risk, they keep a little bit themselves, and they lay off part of that risk to another insurance company, a company that does reinsurance. This is called reinsurance, and the whole reinsurance market works like this, and the companies then reinsure that risk, or most of it, with somebody else. And you can see that it should really dissipate out to the far reaches. And so, you know, notice at the end I've put name. Right? This is because at the far reaches, the people who are accepting the very tiny risks at the end are often ordinary individuals, you know, retired gentlemen with a bit of money who like, the, like to go and play golf and have a formal dinner once a year. And they're the Lloyd's names. In the olden days, Lloyd's names used to be people who'd actually worked in insurance and um, knew something about it. But in, remember I said this is about a long, slow build-up of pressure. One of the things that happened in the run-up to the to the collapse of the LMX spiral was that they were recruiting people who didn't know anything about insurance and didn't understand the risks they were taking. They thought these things were safe. They were buying, an, buying a reinsurance contract, which is, a set, which is an asset on which they would to receive a little premium and, and take no risk. It would never be, the claim would never be called because they were so far out along the spiral that the risk would have dissipated completely by the time it got to them. Unfortunately, that wasn't what was going on. This is what was going on. Recognise it? They were all insuring each other. And this is what my father showed me. He said, he said I actually worked this out, he said, um, where the risk was going. He said, and I laid it off to them, and they laid it off to them, and they laid it off to them, and it all came back to me. And you notice that I've included household and corporations in this, and the reason for that is because the Lloyd's names were ordinary people. So they got hit, and lots of them were bankrupted. The LMX spiral nearly brought down Lloyds of London. It caused major damage. It caused the failure of insurance companies all over the place. My father's own insurance company failed, and he spent the last years of his career as a reinsurance manager managing the runoff and trying to recover as much money as he could. One of the things that happens in this build-up of a boom, of a bubble, if you want to call it that, um, is that standards tend to slip, and he discovered that underwriting standards had indeed slipped, and so he wasn't able to recover some of the money because some, some of the contracts were so poorly written that they couldn't enforce the liability. There's a little bit of a happy ending here because his uh, insurance company was eventually bought by an offshoot of J.C. Flowers, a private equity company, um, cleaned up, stripped down, and is now happily operating as a general insurer. It's no longer doing, doing um, reinsurance but it's still operating under the same name. And I told him this before he died. So here's another, that was another storm. There are lots of them. Here's a few more that I found. Right, there's the great financial crisis. Also the Eurozone crisis. In fact, in many respects, the Eurozone crisis was simply the great storm of 2008 and 9, reforming itself in a different form. The Asian crisis of 1997 to 8, the LMX spiral. The Latin American debt crisis, anybody remember that one? Yeah? And there's a few shaking your heads. Really driven by um, excessive oil revenues and sharper price, sharp oil, oil price rises, really. But um, it's the same kind of thing, a long, slow build up of um, huge flows into. Um, you know, emerging market debt, um, Latin America, Africa, and so forth, they became hugely indebted. They couldn't pay. Um, banks were loaded up with this stuff. The bank I worked for was because it had, rather like 
RBS in 2008, had gone and bought an American bank that was actually loaded with the stuff. Um, Midland Bank couldn't absorb it. It ended up selling Crocker to Wells Fargo for a dollar, but Midland never recovered. It limped on for a few years and eventually got taken over by HSBC. Another life form dies. Yes? It wasn't the only one. And see the two that I've added on the bottom. The Great Depression. There is a huge body of work now that shows that the financial crisis that sparked the Great Depression was very much one of these long, slow build-up, sudden release stories. Huge, huge credit boom. In America, it was a property boom. Also, the German Great Depression, in many respects, I think this is the most interesting of the lot. Because just as in the great financial crisis, people talk about it as if it's an American crisis and had nothing to do with Europe, so we find the same thing with the Great Depression, that we only ever get anybody talking about the Great Depression when they say the Great Depression, they mean America. And they never talk about Germany. But the Great Depression in Germany was as deep as that in America. In 1932, unemployment in Germany touched 30%. It didn't last as long. And what triggered the German Great Depression was a financial crisis. It's very interesting, this, because, as I've said, with the Eurozone crisis really being the reforming of the storm that, burst, that, that caused such devastation in 2008, so too the German Great Depression, in many respects, was the reforming of the storm that made landfall in 1929. It was caused by the failure of a bank. Anybody remember what the bank was? It was actually an Austrian bank called Credit Anstalt. But what had been happening was a huge amount of cross-border lending. There was a nice little round-tripping industry going on between Germany, Switzerland, and the Netherlands, um, fed by American banks. It's funny how American banks are always involved, isn't it? Yeah? So, in 1929, American banks suffered the Wall Street crash, and they all pulled their funds. You can see this in this graphic here. See where it dips, right? There's your long, slow build-up of credits, the boom. Right? Now, note this is bond issues on account of European countries. So we had a massive credit boom going on in Europe. Was the Great Depression really an American crisis? It all crashed in 1929. We had the Wall Street crash. But look at this. It built up again. Right? And the second crash, the failure of Credit Anstalt and then the um, German Great Depression. Um, I say the German one because it was deepest in Germany, but it was actually all over Europe. Look what happened there. It was actually bigger, wasn't it? It was actually worse. And look what else happened. And look how it happened. So we had private capital flowing from flowing into Austria, Germany, Hungary. And then sudden reversal of private capital flows and their replacement with official ones. Now, what does that remind you of? Well, I know what it reminds me of. It reminds me of this. This is the Eurozone crisis. Private money flowing into the periphery countries sudden reversal, and then their replacement with what they call official capital inflows, which is loans from other countries. And as we all know, those loans are very hard to shift. Now, what I've been showing you here is a whole series of um, crises that have a very similar form long, slow build-up that nobody really notices because we're part of it. It's kind of the boiling frog syndrome. You know that if you, you know, this legend has it, if you put a, a, a frog in a pan of cold water and slowly bring it to the boil, the frog won't notice that he's being boiled alive. Well, we're the same. You drop us into a pan of, um, a pan of um, you know, finance and then slowly bring the finance to the boil and we don't, know, we don't notice we're um, about to be boiled alive. We don't see the crisis until it hits, even though P 
people have been warning us about it for years, including, of course, John Kay, who warned about it in 2007. He wasn't the only one. People had been warning about it for some years before that. It's funny how people are not listened to. Now, my point about all of this is that these are storm systems that build because we don't see what is outside our own backyard. So maybe there's a way in which we can look beyond our own backyard and actually try and see things a bit better. Because although I'm saying finance is like the weather and finance is like life, and you might say, well, in that case, there's absolutely no way you can do anything about these storms because they just form, don't they? The fact is, it's still our system. It's still what we create. And we don't have to tolerate this. We can mitigate these storms. They don't have to cause the, da the damage that they do. A, we can see them coming because endogenous shocks, you've got years to see them coming. Uh, so you have time to prepare. And the second thing is that you've got time to see them coming, and actually you've got time to do something to stop them becoming so large and so dangerous, because our flow systems, our financial flow systems, are driven by the interactions between humans. Money is a flow. Money flows all the time. I mean, we talk about money as something that slips through our fingers, burns holes in our pockets, just manages to disappear without warning. You know, I mean, it's how we think of money, isn't it? Even the word currency comes from the Latin word currens, meaning a, a, a stream. Yeah? You think of money flowing. Well, anything that flows can be directed. It can be put in a channel and channeled. Yeah? People are flows. Yeah? Have you ever watched, ever watched traffic flows? You can see the flows, and you can see people being di directed through channels. And the financial system is something we created. Of course it's a flow. We move. So does money. So we can channel it. We can direct it. We can decide where it goes. And we do. And one of the things that we have become, shall we say, not very good at doing is actually making um, decisions for the good of everyone about where money should go. So we create these storm systems ourselves, in a way, by not paying enough attention. We don't look at where money is going. We, don't, we look at the money that stays, and we don't look at the money that leaves. We assume money circulates in our economy when it's at, it just inside our economy, when actually it's circulating over there as well and coming back to us like this, and it's leveraging as it goes. And we don't see the build-up of leverage. This is something that's been talked about a lot since the financial crisis. We seem to think this is a banking phenomenon. It's all to do with the fact that bank, banks create money. So I was quite struck to discover that in the Piper Alpha disaster, in the LMX spiral, the actual amount insured was $1 billion, which at that time was the single largest claim the Lloyds market had ever had. But the, but the claims totaled $16 billion. And that's because the same risk was being re insured multiple times. That's um, money creation, isn't it? So we've suddenly created financial assets that are being sold to the unsuspecting that are based upon something that is fiction. The actual claim itself was only worth $1 billion. <coughs> but on that, they built an edifice of claims 16 times the size. And that's exactly what they did in the financial crisis as well. So maybe we should stop hitting on banks and actually just look at the whole financial system and how it leverages simply because we don't pay enough attention to what is going on and what people are doing and where our money is flowing. For me, what we need to be doing is really mapping where money goes and what claims are being made on assets because there are two sides to this. One is the actual money itself. And the other part of it is 
the way we create assets, the way we create claims on things, multiple claims, claims on claims. That shouldn't be able to happen. But it does, and it does because, because we don't stop it, because we don't direct it, because we don't decide where our money should flow and how it should grow. It's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Because our financial system, our regulation, our um, policy decisions are national, but our financial system is global. And we have as yet not managed to find a way of really making our regulation and our policy regarding finance, where, we're, where our money flows, where we allow our money to flow, where we want it to go, and what we want it to do in terms of creating assets. Um, we haven't managed to make it global. And because of that, we will always have these blind spots, these bits where we just cannot see everything that's going on. Everybody only sees their bit of the market of what's going on. And so we get storm systems developing. I am confident that while that remains the case, there will continue to be intermittent financial crises on varying scales and varying levels of devastation, as there have been throughout the history of finance. The 2008 crisis was not a one-off. It was not even a rarity. It was just one in a very long line of hurricanes. So where do we go? These big financial storms deform our economic system. They change our lives. Life forms die. New life forms grow. Any ideas what the new life forms are that have grown since the financial crisis? Because there are some. There's some very successful ones. Do you know what they are? And you're going to say cryptocurrencies, aren't you? No, cryptocurrencies aren't successful at all. <laughs> the Political sectors. Health system. Uh, mm, defense. No, that hasn't, they haven't grown since the financial crisis. They've been cut, if anything. That's not what's grown. <laughs> the big... Banking. Not even banking, particularly. Um, you know, certainly not in Europe. The European banking system is massively diminished compared to what it was before the crisis. Just look at Deutsche Bank. The American banking system has done all right. But I don't know that I would say that banks in general have been... They, they've been more kind of, kind of limping along, really. And I actually think that the European banking system, and I have to say particularly the German one, actually, is um, a life form that could well find itself becoming extinct. Wouldn't be bad. Yeah. Uh, no, extinction doesn't necessarily happen straight away, you know. Um, <laughs> um, no, the, the life forms that I think have done extraordinarily well since the financial crisis are central banks. We are in the golden age of central banks. They've never been so important. Boy, have they done well. Everybody hates them. And they're, so there are inevitably new life forms growing up They're saying, I want to dislodge them. Yeah? And that is part of the antagonism that sets up new storms. Right? Another life form that has done amazingly well since the financial crisis is the US dollar. Do you know that something like... 88% um, of all foreign exchange trades involve the dollar. The dollar is now used as the main currency for international trade. It's far more important now than it was before the crisis. It's really a considerable success story. Yeah. And the other, the other life form like that has done amazingly well since the financial crisis is regulators. Boy, do we have a growth industry in regulation. It, yeah? So, life forms, new ones, or the development, the growth of new dominant species, some of them parasitic upon the old dominant species. Hmm? And gold hasn't done particularly well. 
Yeah. Stocks have, though. That's another life form that's done really well. Wow, the stock markets. Except they're beginning to suffer a bit now. I'm not quite sure that this life form is, is necessarily going to survive for long, but it did have a bit of a boost. Real estate. And real estate as well. Another bubble. bubble. Another bubble. Mm. New super bubble. Well, bubble say, no, financial crises yeah. seem to happen stocks, about every 10 stocks. years, so uh, it's possible. Um, so, and every time we have another financial crisis, some life form dies. And some other life form grows and becomes important. What that life form is varies. And this is how our economy forms itself. But like I said, it's not, although I said it's like life, it isn't the natural system of, of which we are part, but over which we have not a great deal of control. It's something that we've created ourselves, and therefore we can decide whether this is what we want. Do we want central banks to be that dominant? Do we want the US dollar to be that dominant? Do we want to have mushrooming regulation in an attempt to tie down the things that did so much damage before while allowing other things that are potentially equally damaging to pass, on, pass under the radar? I think it's incumbent upon all of us to notice what is going on, to pay attention to what is going on in other parts of the world that we haven't thought about. I included the Asian crisis for a reason. The Asian crisis was devastating and it had a knock-on effect in the West. We are, not, we are not islands. The global economy is more connected now than it has ever been in its history, and it's more liquid now than it has ever been in its history. We have an incredibly liquid financial system. We have things now that are liquid, which never used to be. We have found ways of making real estate move. That's what securitization does. The more liquid something is, the more likely it is to flow, and the more likely it is to go and... Um, calls tsunamis. So we need to, I guess all of us, pay attention to where money is flowing and perhaps stand up and make a fuss if we see it flowing into places that we think are dangerous or think are just wrong or where we would rather that our money went somewhere else and we definitely would rather it didn't leverage up the way it does and where we see... Um, potentially spirals of risk forming. Perhaps we need to be alert to them. And particularly alert to the kind of mind that's, mindset that says it can't possibly go wrong. I'm not taking any risk. Since you hear lots of people saying that, next crisis isn't far away. Thank you. <laughs>